So in the last video, I talked about IRC, which is a, a popular protocol for doing online chat. And, and it was certainly very popular back in the day, but, but it's still used by many people today. Uh, and, and I kind of talked about how it evolved. And, and really over time, uh, malware writers began to see that they could leverage IRC to control a botnet. So they were looking at it from a different vantage point. Uh, and, and the way that typically worked, at, again, at a very high level is that if you have, let's say, a, a, a system that's infected by malware, uh, what the malware authors would, would do is they would package that system with an IRC client. So let's say you have an IRC client like Merck, uh, and, and that's just one IRC client, but you can imagine others, or just any kind of general IRC client. So any general IRC client. And they would basically package the IRC client together with their malware, and then when the malware got installed in the system and executed, it was designed so that on, on launch, the IRC client would connect to an IRC server. And, and this could be either a, a legitimate IRC server that, that uh, was partially co-opted, or it could be an entirely uh, malicious IRC server operated purely by, by the bot master. But you would have an IRC server here. And the bot would effectively join, or, or the, the IRC client, uh, which is now part of the bot, would effectively join a specific channel, and, and maybe this is, let's say, the, the uh, uh, I am owned channel. Okay. And so you imagine that the, the bot actually connects to this channel, and at this point, the bot is then receiving commands uh, via this channel. So the idea is that the, the bot master can basically put in uh, commands uh, as part of the channel, anybody listening to the channel will basically see these commands streaming across their, their screen or their console, and these commands then in, in turn would get uh, propagated back to the bot, and the bot can then carry out these commands and, and uh, you know, do whatever nefarious deed the bot master wanted the bot to do in that case. Now you may be asking yourself, well, why did IRC become such a popular choice? Well, let me talk a bit about that. I think well, one of the first things to keep in mind, uh, and one of the first reasons I think IRC became very popular is that uh, and, and these are in no particular order, actually. I shouldn't, shouldn't say it's the first reason. There, there could be many reasons, but uh, let me give you a handful that I can think of. So first of all, a lot of IRC clients uh, could be easily scripted. So IRC clients were scriptable. And by scriptable, I mean people could kind of augment them, and uh, you didn't need to understand all the nuances of how the client worked. A lot of the, the clients like Merck, you, you could augment them in ways that might allow you to customize them for your needs. And so in, in this particular case, a bot master would be able to customize uh, a Merck for his needs. And uh, you know the client could be scripted so that software upon installation automatically connects to a specific IRC server, a specific channel. You could script it to announce its presence. And then you could script it to await further instructions on what to do and then parse those instructions and carry out those instructions. So there's a lot you could do when you can script an IRC client. Uh, the second thing, uh, and on the flip side, is that uh, IRC servers were readily available. So you could find IRC servers that uh, you know were open source and you could find easily, or you could use an existing IRC server to do your your nasty work for you. Uh, but but in general, it, it wasn't like you had to you know write your own server. Uh, and and oftentimes, in addition to being available, they, they might be open source. So they could be easily modified by the bot master, and uh, you know, if they're not open source, even if they were open source, uh, they might also be easily customizable. So in other words, you can make modifications to the server code in a way that suits your needs. Okay. The two most common servers that are seen in, in IRC-based botnet operations are uh, a server uh, known as uh, the Unreal IRCD. So uh, Unreal. IRCD, and uh, this actually works on both uh, Linux, or Unix, I guess Unix and Linux flavors, and uh, also works on Windows. Okay, another example of a uh, of an IRC server that was typically seen uh, in botnets is the uh, the conference room server, and it's actually used a commercial uh, IRC server, but uh, you often do see it in the context of uh, being used as a as a botnet CNC server. Okay, uh, those are the, the two big reasons. The third reason why IRC is uh, popular, and these are kind of related, is you kind of get um, 
free or, or to some extent free scalability and uh, fault tolerance. So, and I say I put free in air quotes here because it, um, you know, it's not like I mean IRC is pretty scalable, but I mean it, it's not like that's really designed entirely for scalability. But I think that the way I like to look at it is that. Um, you know, botnet masters did not have to worry about these issues anymore. You know, as a malware author, you can now focus purely on the protocol, purely on what the, the malware was going to do in response to botnet commands. You didn't have to worry about the mechanics of setting up a server of a protocol that communicates between the client and the server, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that the whole um, level, that whole aspect of, of thinking about low-level details of, of network protocols was really taken away from you. You could basically use IRC as a protocol get a client implementation, get a server implementation, and now you can purely focus on what messages are being passed back and forth, and you don't have to worry anymore about the, the lower level details. Okay, uh, and then the other thing is that over time, and this kind of, you know, as you started to see more and more uh, botnets being built using IRC, then there, there kind of became this, uh, this self-propagating effect, and, and you would basically, you would see a lot of bot masters piggybacking on known implementations. So sometimes, what would happen is, Somebody would write an IRC-based botnet, uh, both the client and the server for it, and then the, the client and server might be open sourced, and somebody else who wants to also build an IRC-based botnet can now use that available client and server, build on top of it, add some extra functionality, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, one of the first examples of an IRC-based botnet was uh, one called uh, GTBot. So GTBot was kind of the, the, the one of the first examples people talk about. And many of its successors, um, uh, yeah, yeah, no, GTBot, box, GTBot, and GTBox actually did use MIRC, by the way. So it was a, uh, a Merck user, um, and, and in general, uh, you know, it used Merck as, as in many of its successors, and it also used a scripting language that came with Merck. And, and um, another commonly discussed uh, IRC bot, and kind of an, uh, going along the same lines, uh, was one called Agobot. Agobot. Um, Agobot is also sometimes called Gaobot by uh, security researchers, so just keep that in mind. Uh, so there's two names for it, Agobot and Gaobot. Uh, and, and this is, again, another really well-known and frequently discussed IRC bot. It, its popularity really came about because uh, it, its architecture is fairly well-designed and it uses really good software engineering practices, such as maintaining modular code. And, and because of these reasons, uh, and because its code was readily available, uh, future bot writers like to take Agobot and extend it and improve it. And so, you know, the kind of open source model applied to botnets as well. Now, having said all of this, I, I do want to mention that uh, IRC bots today are not as popular as they once were. And I think one major drawback of IRC bots, and this is really a drawback from a malware author's perspective, is that they are, are much easier to detect. I mean, and, and, and this kind of makes sense, right? A, a number of years ago, IRC was a popular chat protocol. and, and uh, people did use it to chat. I mean, that, that might have been about a, you know close to the early 90s or kind of mid 90s around that time frame. It, it has actually gradually fallen out of favor and really been supplanted by things like instant messaging clients and, and so on and so forth. And so if you do see IRC traffic coming from a machine, I mean, if, if you have a machine and it's it's emanating anything that looks like IRC traffic, that in and of itself is a serious sign that that machine has been compromised because most people who communicate um, don't really do so over IRC and, and, and only a small minority are really still hardcore IRC users. So if you do see IRC traffic coming out of a system, in the absence of any more information, that's already a red flag. Now, there are cases in which people might use IRC legitimately, but I would say that across an entire enterprise, that situation is far less likely. Okay, so um, uh, that's kind of why IRC bots have fall, fallen out of favor um, because IRC traffic does raise a red flag. So I'm going to kind of stop this video right here. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to continue talking about protocols and I will look at uh, HTTP and also uh, in the future peer-to-peer -peer protocols. Hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you in future ones. Thanks a lot.